Welcome to Ask the Experts. Yes, another week of financial advice by the Money Watch crowd. This live webcast is sponsored by Charles Schwab. And I uh, also want to tell you, by the way, before we get into the show, that Money Watch, cbsmoneywatch.com, is recently nominated for a financial services webby. So before we start the program, we want to remind you to go vote for us immediately. Maybe tell all your friends. Tweet it. Make it happen. Uh, and it's a little bit of a pain in the neck process, as my man Jack Otter, who is in the second seat today, explains. It is indeed. But we have a little gold rectangle on the site, moneywatch.com. Click on that, and it will take you as far as we can take you. The rest is up to you uh, as far as voting for us. So come on. We are the long shots. And who doesn't like the uh, the little guy? Come on. <laughs> we're actually the medium guy in this. It's the, We're the happy medium. We're the Goldilocks choice. Well, the, but we're up against a biggie. Yeah, exactly. So we're still the underdog. Exactly. Today is a very exciting episode of Ask the Experts because we have significant and serious royalty with us. So cue the entrance of the queen. It is Jane <laughs> Bryant Quinn. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the famous. Let me read a little bit of this very impressive bio. Do we have time? I don't think so. I swear to It's like, by the way, it just makes a mockery of anything you've ever done in your life. <laughs> Jane Bryan Quinn is a leading commentator on personal finance. I would say the queen, frankly. Um, she's trusted by millions. Let me just see. She's done a million different things. She's been on every single show. She's been network TV, columns, everything. I think probably won a bunch of prizes, books. It's unbelievable. She, well, look at that. She went to Middlebury College. I didn't know that. So great, great lover of uh, Middlebury. That's really should be at the top of the list. I, I think. think so, because now I'm outnumbered by these two Middlebury people. <laughs> uh, what is the most important thing about Jane Bryan Quinn that I can tell you today? She is now da, 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 a Money Watch contributor, blogger, and anything else we can rope her into doing. So, Jane, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jill. I'm a, I'm a little embarrassed. You know, well, but, come on but, now. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Well, where is my crown? That's uh, what I want You know, know what? I want a tiara. <laughs> Megan? A tiara is necessary immediately. We'll have that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Your Highness. Uh, you know, so Jane Brian Quinn, do I have to call you all three names constantly? I, what should I do? I think that <laughs> Jane would probably do it, and you could even do Jay in a pinch. Let me ask you a question. Is the, do, You know, people I've heard refer to as JBQ. Do you like that or not? Actually, yes. I've gotten very used to it because all these years I've been uh, signing my initials on things, and so people just got in scripts and you know, television and all these things. They just started saying JBQ. So I am used to it. You can call me JBQ, too, if all you right. want. All right. I like Queen Jane anyway. Should we tell her what we call me her too. behind her back? What do you call her? I don't know. I call her Queen Jane. Uh, the Mighty Quinn. No, I love that. The <laughs> Mighty Quinn. Fantastic. Jack, what's your nickname? Jack. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Dad. Very bad. I call him Jackson. Uh, <laughs> let me just start by saying we want to. We are very excited by having you here, so it's fantastic. And we've got a ton of questions we're going to get through, so... If you are listening right now and you want to send a question to us, just go to send an email. You can ask the experts at moneywatch.com. If you are watching live, you can right there on the front of the website, pop a little email to us. You can send us a question. We'll get it. If you want to tweet it, I've got my Twitter account open, but let's go. I want a lot of questions. If we don't get to your question today, we will use it next week. We're going to get the queen back here a few times, so don't worry. As long as we can figure out how to get her with enough time from the Upper West Side to where we are, but we'll do it. Um, okay, experts, we got a lot of questions that are ready to rock and roll. So I love this one. I'm diving in. Hi, CBS Money Watch, who, by the way, thank you for using our official name. I'm a 28-year-old stockbroker and have seen a serious cut in my pay. I'm stuck in a car lease with a monthly payment of $700 with gas, insurance, and maintenance. I'm spending over 1200 bucks per month. What options do I have to get out of my car lease? I know you want this question, Jack, so I'm just giving it over to you. It's really a kind of a morality tale, isn't it? <laughs> uh, first of all, this guy's not going to get a whole lot of sympathy, but he does have a lot of options. Uh, the cool ones, I think, are these sites where you can actually go trade your lease in. LeaseTrader.com is the one that has the best PR agency, but there's also one called Swap a Lease. And an amazing statistic that I found on Edmunds.com, in 2008, 50, excuse me, 56% of BMW transactions were reassumed leases. 
Oh, so very So more people were trading their leases than were actually going to the dealership and buying these things in 2008. What kind of knucklehead 28-year-old <laughs> stockbroker is making this decision? I mean, and what kind of, do you think it's a BMW? Is that what you're sensing? Oh, I thought he said that. I guess he did. I imagined it. Gosh, I look know at that. that. Do you know what? I, th- I think in the unedited version, I think it did he say it's he a did? BMW. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So he's going to get out of his lease. Yeah, and it's a, it, apparently it's pretty seamless as long as you can find somebody who the leasing company will approve their finances, then it's, it's a pretty seamless operation. All right. We got, uh, by the way, Mike, I just want to point out that something like 80% of stockbrokers flame out before they're 30 years old, so don't be spending your first commission check anytime too soon. All right, Queen Jane, we've got some questions about financial advisors. This is perfect. This is right up to your alley. First one is from David. I've been with the same financial advisor for six years. The person controls about 65% of my assets. How can I conduct a third-party audit of my advisor's management of my money? And I like this part. Is there a diplomatic way to ask exactly how much money my financial advisor makes off of my money beyond the percentage of assets under management agreement we currently have? It's not clear by now. My If, if it's not clear by now, my advisor's become my friend it's so awkward to ask these questions. What do you think about this one, Jane? First, I wonder what kind of friend this is because <laughs> he's obviously worried about what's happening to his money and he's keeping it there, but he's got a relationship and he's afraid to move out on that account because, yes, my advisor is my friend, but if you're talking about calling in forensic accountants to see where the money is, <laughs> I think you've got kind of a suspicion that your friend isn't doing well by you. Um, yes, of course, you can have somebody look at your account. You can, uh, you, you are entitled to all your records. I hope you have your records. They can hand over the records. You can take it to an accountant. You can take it to a forensic accountant who specializes in going through securities accounts to see what's happened. So that's one thing that can be done. And as far as what he's charging you, you ask. You know, you don't need any tactful way to ask. You say, hey, bud. I want to know what you're really charging me for these things, and I want to know right now, and I want you to write it down, and I want you to sign it so I know. That's how to ask in a tactful way. And he (laughs) is absolutely, he should have told you ahead of time what he was uh, charging you on everything. And by the way, it's not just what he earns. Remember, the firm that he's with is also taking a cut. So the question you want to ask is, what am I paying for every one of these things that you have bought me and I want to know everything. I want to know what's inside the prospectus. I want to know what's outside. I want to make a list of everything and I want you to sign it. Wow. And by the way, what is this whole thing about people getting awkward about how much something costs? I mean, I, I, I think that you're paying for a service. I don't care if the guy takes you out golfing 25 times a season. Ask, ask. It's you're paying for a service. People are so reasonable about asking all of these things if you're i mean people when you're buying a a, a, an appliance or a tv set i hear people in stores in new york negotiating you know right (laughs) in the middle nobody used to negotiate you just saw the ticket and paid the price but when it comes to money somehow they're afraid to ask they think their advisor is their friend to start with and they're really just embarrassed to go and do it they say the same thing with doctors you know Mm. they're afraid to ask the doctor what things cost although i think we're going to start learning how to do that too oh yeah i think that's going to be a new a new skill set we're going to develop Uh, i can give this guy one little bit of help if he's if he if he doesn't take the jane straightforward approach you can deduct all of every single one of these expenses So it would be very fair for him to say, look, I got killed in taxes this year. I need to find more deductions. Please spell out exactly what I'm paying you. You know what? That's a a good idea. Okay, but that is like so waspy of you to suggest. I mean, are you kidding me that like you just go through the front door. (laughs) Hey, I don't get how you pay me. There's no shame in it. I got to clarify it now. I love that Jane would like have it written out also because you're going to forget in a year what the next time he takes you out for dinner. Well, you know, the other thing is if if he really doesn't want to tell you and he's hiding something and it turns out that when your accountant does go over your accounts, there's something wrong, you're going to be very happy to have his signature on something like that. Ooh. And if he doesn't want to sign it, you're, that might tell you something, too. <laughs> this sure episode will. of Ask the Experts <laughs> is po- sponsored by Charles Schwab. See, I like to say it that way because it sounds like a sponsorship thing. Uh, Jane, I have a question for you. Are you a fan of the fiduciary or meaning that the 
do you think that people should really only work with a, an advisor who has to put you first? Are you okay with a stockbroker? I am okay with a fiduciary. I feel very strongly about that. I, I think that people simply misunderstand what stockbrokers are doing for them. And I think that a stockbroker will put you in something suitable if you say you want a 401k plan for your kids and your state has a tax deduction. And But another state pays a high commission and doesn't have a tax deduction, broker could put you into that and that would be suitable. Mm. A fiduciary could not put you into that. A fiduciary has to put your interests first. So I'm very high on fiduciary and I'm really sorry that it got dropped out of the bill in Congress. Yeah, it's a shame. We call it the F word around here, <laughs> but um, we don't get to go there. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit. Shelly has, qu- has a question about a job interview She recently had a job interview. She thought it went well. However, I didn't get the job. I was required to list personal references, including fellow employees I'm currently working with. My question, can I find out if one of those references gave me a negative report? Do I have the right to find out, Jack? I'm afraid you probably do not have the right. And in my experience, an interviewer really shouldn't go to your current colleagues at your current job. Yeah, I thought that was kind of no Until maybe as a very final last step to make sure everything's okay. Now, if it went that far and they said something that cost her the job, then she's got a real problem and, and, and she needs to find out what she's doing wrong, not just for employment reasons, but what's the tension here that's probably getting in the way of her work. Um, I think her first step should simply be to go to the interviewer and, and adopt a very friendly tone and say, hey, as I think about my career, I, I want to make sure that I don't make any mistakes I may have made uh, in the past, in the future. Um, could you just tell me whether you, you whether it got so far that you went to references or not? Now, the funny thing is, I used to, you know, as, as an employer, when people would call up and say, we want to check references, we'd always say, we don't give references. We say, yes, she worked here from this point to this point, and that's it, because there's so much weird liability out there. Oh, so. Boy. I, I don't I think most big companies will not actually give glowing references anymore. They'll just verify that you work there. So it may be, Shelley, that you actually are a little bit suspicious here. Maybe someone didn't blackball you. Maybe the guy didn't like you who was interviewing you. Or there could have just been a better candidate. You're Maybe very was real good. Pollyanna I'm, today. I'm in, I'm in My God, I thought yeah. you said you had a headache. We got nominated for a Webby Award. Oh, go vote for the Webbies. Did we tell you that? Go yeah. vote for the Webbies. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you how to do that. Hold on a second. Good reminder, Jack. Where do we do that? Oh, gosh, I have to do it. Anyway, it's on... Uh, it's on MoneyWatch.com. On MoneyWatch.com, we'll on you. our box. and says, yeah. go vote here, and we'll link you to it, and go vote for us as the very best financial resource in the entire universe. Okay. Uh, our next question comes from Marsha, who's 60 years old, married, and her home is paid for. So Marsha has just inherited twenty five grand. She wants to invest it safely for the next six months to a year, what should I do? And Jane, she says she wants to put ten or fifteen thousand dollars towards a home down payment in the spring of two thousand eleven. What should she do with that chunk of money? There is only one thing to do, and that's to keep it totally safe. I mean, you don't want to invest that any place where you might lose it. So you've got a choice between a bank and a money market fund, and that's about it. Anything else that you put into a short term bond fund, anything like that could lose some money by the time six months or a year is up. So I just say you keep it absolutely safe. I mean, with the interest rates as low as they are, you could probably put it in your mattress and have the same difference. <laughs> but, but I'm not advising that. No. But the bank, I mean, it's crazy to try to invest money you're going to need in six months or a year. Yeah. Don't even think about the interest rate. Keep it safe so it'll be there when you want it. Now, there's a second part of this question from Marsha, who has two grandchildren who have special needs, and she wants to put some money aside for them for college but she doesn't want to put it in their names so is there an alternative for someone like that I don't know I mean it doesn't seem like it's enough money to have a special needs trust I don't know if you put the money in the 529 plan whether it's counted against the kids if they need it for Medicaid later what do you think she should do I don't know about the 529 plan and that I mean the 529 plan would be my first thought and I because that's a plan for college education and you can the money accumulates their tax deferred and you can take it out for college but it's in the grandmother's name so it's not in the kids name so it seems to me that this should be okay with Medicaid and the and also you know the grandmother can take it back anytime she wants which is one of the little angles of the 529 here she can put the money in and she can take the money out if she starts worrying about it but I would say that's probably the best bet for for the children's education so Jack just a little point here you heard that Jane said you could take the money out of your kid's college <laughs> education program and buy the house that you wanted at the beach. I was making a call on my phone. All right, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, sure. All right, you got that one. Okay, our next question is from Albert. He's concerned about his credit report, he writes. 
I used to have about $15,000 in credit card debt. I've settled the debts for about 8000 Bully for him, though. That's a pretty Absolutely, good yeah. deal, right? How will this affect my credit report? Will it improve since I paid everyone off or not since I settled for them at a discount? FYI, I do own my own house. I'm not late on those payments. My truck payment has never been late. And my credit report, report shows that I paid off two cars in the past. Jane, is this going to... Is negotiating for a lower rate going to hurt his credit? Well, if he hasn't been paying, and so he's got a big default on his credit, and then he comes in and settles, that should actually improve his credit. I mean, that's a good (laughs) thing that he's done. Better than just having it sit there, not at all. A settlement is still not a good thing to have on your record, but it's a whole lot better than a default to have on your record. And if all the rest of your credit is good, I'd say, you know, in a couple of years, you're probably going to be okay. Jack, um, do you think people are obsessive about their credit right now? That should they check it any more than once a year? Uh, no, and and I, frankly, if you don't have a big purchase on your horizon and you're doing things right, I guess you should check it once a year just to make sure there's no errors or something. Right. But otherwise, it's it's really not a big deal. I, I'm kind of interested that this guy owns his house outright. I and know. He still got his credit card companies to cut his credit card bill in half. Um, if he doesn't. I, I'm a little, a little concerns me a little bit too. You know, we talk about the morality of these things on the show occasionally, and I kind of would have liked him to see see him take out a HELOC, you know, make good on his debts, and then pay that off slowly or figure out something. A home equity line of credit Sorry, for yep. those of you who don't love that jargon. And, and there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't tap into your home to pay off credit cards. I know, but I, I it, always liked. I would rather. I think it actually forces people to pay it more. Well, the generally. idea of going from a secured mm. credit than mm-hmm. unsecured to a secured. But. Uh, well, you know what. I'm, I'm hoping he learned a lesson. This is where I'm going with this because how did you get 15 grand in credit card debt anyway? But I don't, I'm not the big moralist, but like time to get a control on your Sounds spending. like he has. I think so. Remember, I'm Pollyanna today. Jeez. This question is from Paula. She's a question about the new health insurance laws. My son, age 23, is a full-time college student. He was previously unable to be listed under my husband's insurance, not because of the insurance company, because of my husband's employer slash union contract. Does the new legislation override the contract? Who knows the answer to this, Jane? I don't. I, and, I, and in fact, I thought about it a lot, and I even made a phone call about it. The fact is they don't have any regulations yet. That's exactly uh, right. So <laughs> there's the, nothing we don't know. I mean, the contract is a contract. It may be that the contract overrides, but we simply cannot tell. We don't know if if it's okay if, you're, if we'll take a married kid on, if the kid has to be single, if the kid has to be a tax dependent. We have no information. It starts in September. So by September, we'll have some information. And so, again, that's right. I just want to emphasize that. So for the for your kids to go on your insurance, there's this weird six-month wait. Um, I think that what everybody who has to do is actually go to the employer, whatever the employer-sponsored plan is, whoever's providing your benefits, and in six months, you bang on the door, and hopefully that's where you get. But there aren't – I mean, this is a little bit of the Wild West here. We got this legislation. There's going to be a ton of details that we don't know about. And we're going to have to be a little bit patient on this, right? All right. For sure. All right. Uh, hey, if you've got a question, click on the link at the side of our homepage, send us a question, or send an email to asktheexperts at moneywatch.com. This episode of Ask the Experts is sponsored by Charles Schwab. we got more questions, though. Here we go. Um, here's Patty. She's got a word that I really don't like to pronounce, but I'm going to do it. Because I went to my talent coach, and I practiced this before our last video. I have a friend that called the FAFSA, <laughs> FAFSA hotline and asked if she needed to report an inheritance on her daughter's FAFSA form. They said no. Also, a local CPA said that the parent did not have to report that. Is that true? I have 60 grand in cash inheritance. I want to make sure that I don't need to report it on the form. Jane. So, first, another F word. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, the That's FAFSA form. Bit. This is the form you have to fill in. Anybody looking, any student looking for a scholarship money, aid money, st- student loan, you have to fill in the FAFSA form. That's where it all begins. Uh, an inheritance, and they ask about your income. An inheritance is not income. There is nothing on the FAFSA form that says this is income. So, I would say forget that. However, they do ask about the parents' assets, mm-hmm. and your inheritance is an asset. So that should be listed with your assets, and they tap it for, actually, f- they assume that 5.6% of your total assets are available to help pay for college after a whole lot of deductions for your retirement plan and this and that and the other. But it will get lumped with your a- assets, but it's not income. 
And so we have it. And don't give it to your child because a higher percentage of the child's assets get dinged as part of that formula. Right. And uh, we always like to caution against putting money in your child's name, even though I'm sure your kid will be the (laughs) most responsible 20-year-old. We're not so sure his or her friends will be. Or, you know, just weird things happen. So try not to get that money all in the kids' names. Uh, This is a great general question for Jack Otter. I would like to, this is from Willie, I'd like to start saving in mutual funds. I don't know which one of the money managers are good ones. Jack, is this a layup or what? <laughs> uh, Willie, guess what? Nobody knows which are the best money managers. And a lot of people will tell you they do, but they're wrong. So what you do is you're going to bet on all money managers by investing. And I'm assuming that this is long-term money because otherwise we're going to follow Jane's earlier advice of basically put it under the mattress. Um, if you're investing for the long term, uh, then we're big fans at Money Watch of index funds, which track the entire market. Um, and I don't know how much money you're talking about here. If it's a significant amount uh, and, and you're not familiar with finances, I would say hire a fiduciary and have that person um, set up a financial plan for you that's broadly diversified, uh, set up a plan where you're contributing regularly to it. Um, you will be paying rock bottom fees by investing in index funds. And you can comfortably sleep at night knowing that you will beat 80% of all other investors, no matter how fancy their hedge funds are. Queen Jane, you're agreeing with that. There's a lot of nodding going on. Yeah, a lot of nodding. I'm in absolute, total agreement with that. And one thing, you hire a fiduciary to help you. I would would just say hire a planner who is a fee-only financial planner. And that's somebody who doesn't sell any products, all the planner does is charge for his or her advice. Because if you wind up with a planner who sells products, they're going to sell you the products. And then you're not going to get the wonderful index funds that Jack has just been telling you about. And, um, is, and, and by the way, of course, ask how much they charge. We like that going back to the beginning of the show. Don't be afraid to ask what they're charging you. Uh, okay, before we end the show, we have uh, had a lot of hearings about financial reform. So let's just do sort of a general temperature here of the experts. Uh, Jack, financial regulatory reform, what are we going to get? Anything Anything interesting? Anything good going to happen? Or is it going to just fizzle out, you know? <laughs> uh, it, it's so hard for me to tell. This morning I heard um, Bob Corker talking, and he sounds so reasonable when he's interviewed and and really middle of the road. And he talks about working with both sides and there's none of this populist grandstanding. And yet nobody seems to be able to get his vote. So I, I, Jane has written a wonderful blog post on this, her inaugural blog post for MoneyWatch.com. I honestly have trouble reading the tea leaves here. I suspect we'll get something and it will be a little bit watered down, but I'm just not sure. Um, I'm worried, in fact, that, that at least on the general broader reform side, that we'll wind up with nothing because mm-hmm. it'll be talk, 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 and, and the Republicans will sort of agree, and then they won't agree, and then they won't vote, and the Democrats will, will argue among themselves, <laughs> and, and you'll have, have that kind of a result. And then, then they might actually, which is shocking to me, it's possible that they would do nothing. Oh, oh my God. I have a good deal of hope that they will do something. I still, my, my, the thing I care most about, I'm writing about all the time, is the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, which I think is absolutely critical. It's the only thing for consumers in the bill that is there to try to prevent these terrible mortgages and credit cards and subprime credit cards that, that you that you had such trouble with before that just killed you before if this were in effect you know they'd stop those things and they couldn't mess you up so i have some hope actually that that will go through there's been some talk of just having an up and down vote on the agency and letting everything else uh go into a package and slip and slide past the next election but i don't know the the president is very strong for it and the dems do think that they can beat up the republicans by saying you stand with wall street what are you doing we stand with families we're going to have to see. Well, uh, one thing that I really hope for, and it's I think it's difficult to sell because it's hard to understand, but something that required derivatives to be traded in an open market where everyone can see them. I mean, frankly, I'm not going to be able to understand them. Um, Jane probably will be able to. Uh, no. But but the oh, important thing no. <laughs> is you will have very motivated short sellers going through this stuff and being able to call, you know, scream bloody murder when they see bad stuff happening if it's all done out in the opening. But if it's not done in the open, then forget about it. And for a moment here, let's just thank the women who are the heroes of the crisis. And I will tell you who they are. Well, Elizabeth Warren, who's championed the Consumer 
Financial Protection Agency. Yes. Sheila Bear. Sheila, Sheila Bear. No. Yeah. I like her. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm a little worried, but okay, I like her. I'm going to put her on those. My numero uno heroine, Brooksley Bourne, yes. the yes. woman you've never heard of. <laughs> Brooksley Bourne, wonderful woman. Unbelievable. So Brooksley Bourne was the chairman of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, who actually in the 90s said, I don't really get these derivatives. I don't really see what's happening. Maybe we should have some sort of regulation of them and have them traded in a place where we could we could actually figure out what's going on. And then the, I would say, the evil stepsisters, <laughs> Larry Summers, Alan Greenspan, and Arthur Levitt, who was, so Arthur Levitt was head of the SEC then, Greenspan was the Fed chair, and Larry, and Larry Summers and Robert Rubin, who were both part of the Clinton administration, beat her up, practically got her fired, although she just ended up walking away because they were so horrible. And thankfully that they did nothing because, gosh, our reward was we got a financial meltdown <laughs> just years later. So anyway, go look up Brooksley Bourne. There's actually a fantastic um, series about her from Frontline, from PBS's Frontline, called The Warning. And y you go find out she's the hero, the heroine for all of this. All right, it's time to go. Megan's bothering me now. She says we have to go work on other things. This episode of Ask the Experts was sponsored by Charles Schwab. We want to thank you all for joining us. Jack Otter, even though you had a piercing headache, you seemed to put on your game face. I came back. I rallied. Yeah. Queen Jane, Brian Quinn, we are really, we humble. We're <laughs> humble at your service here. We serve at your pleasure. Thank you so much. We're so excited to have you aboard. And, of course, in honor of your joining Ask the Experts, which we'll see you here every week, I'm sure. Uh, we also got you some of your own theme music. So uh, send us questions, guys. <laughs> Ask the experts at moneywatch.com. And you can even just say, Queen Jane, I have a question. Thanks for watching. <laughs> I was going to demand trumpets. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>